Hi, everybody. This is Peter Diamandis, and welcome back to Exponential Wisdom. I'm here with my dear friend, Dan Sullivan, my mentor, my partner, my friend, Dan. A pleasure. Good to see you. Peter, I can handle most of your topics really well, but I'm kind of vibrating <laughs> with the one you're going to introduce. Now, all this time you've talked about acceleration, and now uh, you're doubling down. Yeah, so this topic is one that I call Accelerating the Acceleration. And it's a realization that things are about to get much faster. If you've been worried about or excited about the rate of speed at which technology is changing the world, let me just say you ain't seen nothing yet. A lot of my friends in Silicon Valley have said people have no idea how fast things are changing. And it's so true. So let me give a quick overview, Dan, and then I want your take on these. So we all know mm -hmm. Moore's Law, mm -hmm. and Gordon Moore, who founded Intel, noticed that the number of transistors per piece of silicon was roughly doubling every 12 to 24 months for the same dollars. And so computation was growing and growing exponentially. And our friend Ray Kurzweil has his Kurzweilian curves of all of this computational growth over the last 120. 10 years. So that's like the fundamental of mm -hmm. accelerating technology. But there's a lot of other factors compounding this, making it even faster. And I want to just share those with folks. So first thing is that while computers are getting faster, everything riding on top of computers is also getting faster. So for example, sensors and networks, AI robotics, 3D printing, augmented and virtual reality, synthetic biology, as computers get faster, so do all these other technologies which are using computation. Mm -hmm. So 3D printers are getting faster. Synthetic biology is getting easier. So people don't realize that, but I mean, that's the very first accelerant is that our exponential technologies, all of them are accelerating as computation is getting faster. Yeah. Well, the way that I've tried to explain it to my entrepreneurs in the workshop, I said, think of a massive river that's flowing and it's flowing downhill, of course, for it to be going in one direction. And I said, but as you go, if you cross the river, you would notice that the current would continually change speed. The one, the current in the middle is by far the fastest. And then as you go to the other side, some parts of it are actually going backwards. They're getting caught up in eddies and actually reversing. And I said, now think of everything human operating on that river, and people have different tolerances for the speed that they could actually go. So I think that the computation is very definitely the very, very middle force. It's the central force of the, the exponential river, if we put that term on it, exponential wisdom. But the big thing that's changed so much is that when Ray starts talking about the 1900 computation capabilities, and even back then, this doubling factor, the increase in speed and the halving and the price of computation was absolutely true there. But the introduction of it, the automation of the computing process, which Gordon Moore in 1965, when he made what became the Moore's Law, this has now become the law because everything's related to this Moore's Law. But here's the thing I have to ask you. It seems to me that the number of minds, connected minds, that are actually connected to the multiplying force, the accelerating force of technology is the real key things because all of a sudden you get these massive parallel thinking going on. Well, I Dan, mean, right. that's the next force that's accelerating things. It's a number of people actually using technology. So in 2010... There was 1.8 billion people connected online. Today, circa 2017-18, it's about 3, 3.2 billion people connected. But by 2025, the expectation is due to Facebook and Google and OneWeb and SpaceX, and I'm sure Amazon will play in the game, there will be 8 billion people connected. So we have 5 billion new minds who've never uploaded or downloaded or come up with a new piece of technology. So we're about to increase the cognitive capacity on planet Earth by 150%, and that's going to just juice everything up, accelerate everything, more inventions mm -hmm. coming out of those individuals, more new companies, more ideas, more technology as more people come online. 
Well, one of the things I've observed when I'm watching your webinars where you have more than one or two individuals or you have a screen full, I had a game changer call using Zoom because I really love the Zoom format with panel discussions, and I had five game changers on it. And I was noticing the totally different kind of thinking that was taking place during the hour we were on. One was because they were connected. We were all talking about the same topic, but they were listening to everybody else's talking about the topic that they were thinking about. And I could just see this massive expansion of understanding, shared understanding, that came about simply because they could see each other on screen. They were all there for the same purpose, and they could be affected by other people's experience, other people's knowledge. They were very, very inspired by other people's growth and the success of the other people. Now take that up to 8 billion people. I had five on the screen. Yeah, there's a compounding factor of end-to-end interactions. Another factor that's interesting is when you think about how much a true genius can move the dial, right? A Stephen Hawking, an Albert Einstein, a Beethoven, you know, pick your favorite genius from nations and countries around the world. In the long tail of human cognitive ability, there's people who are truly genius. And if a genius is born in the middle of downtown London and is noticed, they're plugged into the ecosystem, their brain is fed, their genius gets out. If they're born in the middle of Tanzania in a village with no connectivity and no power, the chances that that person ever actually plugs into human society is near zero. It's the old biblical adage of throwing seeds onto the rock and it never lands in fertile soil and it never grows. So I think one of the things we're going to see over the next seven to eight years is that no place on the planet's not connected. Mm -hmm. And out of eight billion people, we're going to see many more geniuses coming online in human society, which I don't think can be, has been talked about or is predictable in terms of its impact on society. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, I think that history has been recorded wrongly about geniuses because it's always depicted as a single individual who suddenly has a blazing insight and really changes the world with his or her idea. But the fact of the matter is, if you go back and examine the conditions of everybody that we consider a genius, they were hanging out with dozens of other people and bouncing ideas off other people. I'm a lifetime fan of Johann Sebastian Bach, one of the great Baroque composer. And They've done extensive studies, and there was like a five-generation development, five-human generation, covering pretty close to, you know, 130 or 140 years, where in this single family, there were about 400 Bachs who were composers or singers or musicians. And he came at the end of this, so I got the feeling that what he's given 100% credit for, he was actually aggregating. Mm -hmm. He was actually aggregating breakthroughs that probably dozens, perhaps hundreds of his relatives had made, but he had an aggregator mind, and he was able to capture everything and put it down, and it's like he's the single genius. I mean, if you take a look at Einstein, Einstein was surrounded in Germany and then in New Jersey when he came over to uh, the United States before the Second World War, he was surrounded by dozens of really brilliant people who challenged his mind. So what you're saying is it's not the question, is there geniuses in another part of the world? But what this is doing, Peter, it's taking the conditions of developing genius everywhere in the world. I agree with that. In other words, your community can be an incredible community because it's now a digital community. But it's also helping those who have the predilection for genius to fully realize it. Mm -hmm. But there's something else that's about to happen now. And Ray Kurzweil pegs this as the mid-2030s. My friend Brian Johnson was with last night for dinner, who's the CEO of Kernel, is aggressively working on it right now. And it's the notion of augmented genius. It's the idea that we're going to plug your brain, my brain, everybody's brain into the cloud, into Google, and you'll have a million-fold more cognitive capacity and memory. So we're going to supercharge everybody's innate genius. 
if your intelligence went up by a thousand times by a plug-in, Peter, what would you use it for? Probably telling better jokes. <laughs> Goodness, I, or remembering them. Yeah, or remembering them. That's probably true. <laughs> you just have a little psst that comes through. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like I used to remember one joke. I've forgotten that joke as well. Still, the fundamental issue becomes: What do you use? I mean, I believe we're going to be physically augmented, where we have a lot more physical strength, you know, a lot more physical capabilities. But what do you use it for? You know, I mean, it still comes down to the issue that. People who are unfocused will just be unfocused in a exponential way. I know, but I know a lot of amazing smart people from Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Larry Page, and they have tremendous intellect yes. and luck and opportunity and all those things, but intellect is fundamentally there. Yeah. And I think more intellect, more genius will help us solve the world's biggest problems, help us explore, help us create new societies. It's insane when you think about if we could truly up the amount of human intelligence on the planet, what would happen, especially if we did it in the White House. I won't go there. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, the next accelerant that is really a fascinating acceleration of the acceleration is the amount of concentrated wealth in the hands of individuals and the moonshots they're taking. Mm -hmm. I find this fascinating that we do have those people I just mentioned, plus Larry Page and Paul Allen and Bill Gates and many others who are concentrating wealth like never before mm -hmm. and are now using it for taking on extraordinary moonshots. You know, Zuckerberg donates $3 billion and says, I want to end all disease. Mm -hmm. So I think that the concentration of wealth and the audacity of the moonshots people can now take is extraordinary. As you know, Peter, I'm a news junkie and have been since probably eight years old. One of the real interesting things, because the magazine still exists, not very important anymore, but Time magazine, if you go back to 1952, when it really was a powerful news news vehicle, and you trace it, it's more than 65 years right now, and you take the covers of that and you say, well, what activities on the planet, and it's usually an individual's face that's on the cover, in the 1950s, it was military people, it was athletes, might have been popular entertainment stars, could be popes, could be kings. But you fast forward up until probably the last 20 years, and increasingly it's these type of fundamental moonshot type of entrepreneurs that are showing up on the front cover. And I think Time is just picking up what is generally recognized in the society. I don't think Time magazine is a particularly risk-taking organization. So they're just picking up on what the general mood is, what the general thought is. I go back, I think that the real breakthrough guy here was Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve Jobs was the first rock star mm -hmm. who kind of put entrepreneurs there. But I think that that set a standard for a lot of other people wanting to, you know, you want to have that kind of fame, you want to have that kind of celebrity and everything else. That's not all that's involved, but it's certainly a factor involved. But the whole thing is they wouldn't be rock stars unless there were rock star fans. And so what there are a lot more rock star fans for these type of big industry changing technology changing breakthroughs that are associated with single individuals who have an enormous amount of wealth. One more massive acceleration factor, and my last one, is what I call interface moments. Those of you who've been part of A360 have heard me talk about interface moments before. It was a realization I had. I was interviewing Mark Andreessen, who was the creator of Netscape, and previously that mosaic. He was at University of Illinois in the early 90s, and he came up with a what was the first browser on top of ARPANET. In 1993, Mosaic was born. And as I was talking to him, I was interviewing him at Singularity University, he talked about the growth of websites that could be viewed by Mosaic. So in the first year, there was something like 10,000 websites created. Like in the first year, it was like 100 websites, and then it grew to 10,000, and then to a million and then to tens of millions. And you had this exponential growth. And the realization I had was Mosaic and Netscape was an interface that allowed anybody, you and me, any entrepreneur, to use this powerful system called the internet, called ARPANET. Mm -hmm. 
not only could I use it, but I could make money on top of that. I could generate revenue. So I hit me that there's these interface moments, a moment when an interface was born that allowed entrepreneurs to use massive capacity. Another interface moment was when the app store came online and allowed entrepreneurs to build apps on top of these millions of iPhones. And I just looked it up last night. It's 140 billion downloads of apps. I mean, that's insane. So we're about to hit the ultimate interface moment. And let me pitch you on this. Mm -hmm. It's the moment where AI allows me to use all technologies. So I don't actually know how to use CRISPR-Cas9. I know roughly what it does. I know you can create a CRISPR-Cas9 molecule that will go into a very specific edit on a genome. But imagine that I can describe what I want. I say, listen, I really want to reduce the amount of insulin I put out or I want to increase my insulin I put out or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And I can speak to an AI and describe the intended outcome I want. And then that AI interfaces with the digital biology tools I need to modify my own genome. Or I can describe that I want a cup with this kind of curved handle and open mouth and I want it to be cheap but thermally insulating. I can describe my desires and the AI can 3D print Mm -hmm. what I want. Mm -hmm. So AI is going to become the ultimate interface moment allowing anyone who can describe what they want to use all the technologies to build for them what they desire. That makes sense? Yeah, well, I do. And, uh, you know, I read an article on this this quarter, and I said they're talking about the new, what will be the new, so that you have petroleum now, you have fossil fuels, you have the notion of solar, you have the notion of wind, biofuels, and everything. They're talking about the new source of energy. And Everybody says, well, you're missing the number one new source of energy, and it's tapping in exponentially to human intelligence. This is the new number one energy source on the planet, Mm -hmm. and it seems to really resonate with what you just said there, the very notion that our brains can work together as a form of energy. Because if you think of the productivity of two people a line just comparing thoughts, what comes out of that doesn't require actual very much energy in physical terms, but it generates enormous energy. It's almost like the energy generated is way more than the energy used, which has always been the goal you know, of all energy. Peter, I just want to say one thing, because underlying everything we're talking about here is one platform that we are taking advantage of Recently, I was in front of a group of entrepreneurs, and they said, when you look back at your entrepreneurial life, what would you change? What would you make different? And I said, as far as my own life, nothing. I said, I wouldn't have changed a thing. I said, because I've learned from everything. But I said, I would have introduced the internet earlier. Hmm. Well, pal. You too. Yeah. You would have introduced. Where were you when I needed you? I tell you. I tell you. But just to summarize and close this out here, for those listening, you know, we're living during the most extraordinary time, and it's not slowing down, it's speeding up. And there are all of these factors, we're about to intercept quantum computation, so computation is getting faster, all the exponential technologies on top of that, interface moments with AI, allowing 8 billion people connected to utilize all those exponential technologies, more brains, more wealth creation ever before, more genius ever before. And so next time someone says, oh, this kind of rapid increase in technology and this rate of change can't continue, oh, yes, it can. And it's going to get faster. Mm -hmm. And the goal you have is to, as I say, surf on top of the tsunami instead of getting crushed by it. So exciting times ahead. Any dreams are going to be well within reach. Thanks a lot, Peter. My pleasure, Dan. Look forward to our next session. See ya.